much greater understanding. And oh, you're recording now. <laughs> and, so anyways, just let me tell you a little bit about Kasia. She was an English teacher in Poland and ah. then became a nutritionist later. She went to Bastyr University and graduated from there in 2005 with a master's degree in clinical nutrition. And then she did an additional program and uh, went to Maryland University of Integrative Health for a functional clinical nutrition program and graduated as a doctor in clinical nutrition in 2017. She's got a lot of experience teaching. She's written several papers or co-authored papers. She's very scientific, which is so nice because everything that she teaches you in her book and in her seminars is based on science. It's proven to work in the literature. Um, and um, let's see, I think that's all I have about you, Kasha. And she, and she teaches you to treat it naturally. And she really has a lot of experience with what works and what doesn't work. And just like so many of these other chronic illnesses, there's many, many facets, the emotional piece, the sleep piece, the food piece. And she has little pearls for all that stuff. And if you do her seminar, she shares so much of her um, handouts for patients and whatnot. And it's just such a great resource. Thank you so much, Kasha. So uh, with that said, I will give you Kasha Kynes to give you her brief review of EBV. And here she is. Oh my gosh. Welcome, welcome everyone to, to this session. I am honored and humbled. Uh, am I on? Can you hear me, see me? Everything's okay? All right. So you see, uh, yeah, so, uh, oh, thank you for a beautiful introduction. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, when your patients don't heal, no matter what you do. Um, I will stay, because I understand you have 30 minutes panel with questions and answers afterwards. I'm, I'm honored to stay, and so I can answer any questions later. So I'm gonna focus on the lecture now. A couple of logistics before we start. We ha well, I have a scratchy throat because we have burning forests and I volunteer 10 hours every week outdoors. So, so I'll be drinking aloe, so don't mind me. Um, and of course I was asking, I have an instant conflict of interest because I train doctors and I, I wanna train a million people if I have to. We need an army of, of doctors helping people that are falling through the cracks. And I just wanna tell you today, I wanna honor your patients I want to honor those complicated cases, those where you hit the wall, because I did, those dedicated, committed patients that come with you with a stack of labs that have spent, you know, $100,000, $200,000, $50,000, seven, eight years, 20 years of their lives, sometimes they're all, all their adult life pursuing how to get over this are misdiagnosed, mistreated, mismanaged, all alone, misheard, put on antidepressants, shoveled around. They don't deserve that. And the, the big umbrella hovering over that may just be epstein barr virus because this is what happened to me. And so I want to give you the light and the hope that Monday morning when you go in back into your clinical practice over your office, you're not going to look at your patients the same way. You'll have a vision of how much more you can help people that are failing everywhere else and where you also hit the wall. I, I certainly was there. And I also want to say for these patients, I am so delighted to be here because, you know, DOs, NDs, functional MDs, integrative MDs, nutritionists, functional nutritionists, you are primed for this work. You do mold remediation help. You do heavy metal work. You do gut work. You do autoimmune work. You do all these components. And let me tell you the big picture that I want you to take from this is that EBV is predictable. It's not a big monster. It's predictable, treatable, reversible. If it's just EBV, but most of the time it comes with a bucket and the bucket is all those complications. And so you really are primed for this. You can, you can change lives. It is life-changing. The virus is life-changing and this work can be absolutely life-changing and rewarding. So with that, okay, let me see, there we go. I don't have to do the introduction. I'm just gonna say that we have a lot of resources, free, low, low tickets, the website hub that we created, that is evidence-based, it's ebvhelp.com right here. So this is always a place to go if you have somebody that has questions and, and concerns and you don't want to talk to them. And 
Uh, as you can imagine, we're talking about a big elephant in the clinical room, and we have a lot to cover. Uh, there are some slides that are more technical. I'll leave them out. I'm just going to tell you stories and simplify things because I know what the bottom line is. If you're scientific nerds, you can pursue that. That the, you know all the references are at the end of the slides. We're going to talk about what EBV is, its prevalence, the acute versus chronic infections, the most and least common presentations, the, the uh, issues like cancer, autoimmunity, neurological issues, uh, the efficacy of prescription medications, uh, and the common pitfalls in medical practice. I want to slow down there and really just uh, you know reconnect with you and where you are because I've seen it all and I want to guide you and then the latency and lysing phases of EBV that are quite misunderstood a little bit about immune system the triggering factors the recovery foundations realistic expectations and my goal is a bird views bird eyes view of most and least beneficial supplements and dietary uh, guidance most and least effective diets. I won't be able to go deep into any of these resources. I just need to signal them within the constraints of the time. So with that, uh, I wish I could see your faces and ask if anybody is getting excited about this because this is a huge deal. Uh, I can imagine yes faces. So let's get started. Uh, EBV is a human herpes virus for most of the most common viruses in humans on the planet. It's about 100 million years old, and we have about 95 or more percent of incidence of positive ser serology. Nearly all seropositive people actively should shed the virus in the saliva. Most get uh, infected at some point. Many don't remember, especially in childhood. It can be a sniffle. Parents don't remember. So with this... <laughs> Moderna is uh, doing a pilot study on the global vaccination. And by the way, I did not any slides about COVID vaccination, long haulers, but if we have maybe in questions and answers, if you're interested, I can address that because there's research, there's a lot going on in our community. I can report on these. It's an addition. So with that context, how what, what, what do I want you to see? Mothers will be really depressed over the fact that they may have infected their baby in the womb and during pregnancy, okay? And spouses oftentimes fear for the significant other. You know, I have this chronic EBV, what about my spouse? So what I need you to know is we all have it. I had it, I tested for it at the ripe age of 55 uh, last fall when I started tr to trickle into it because EBV is an opportunistic virus. And I had a golden opportunity, moldy house after moldy house, when my immune system was affected. So we all kind of carry it. And that global vaccination doesn't make sense, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, but the, the point is that the body is equipped to keep it down, keep it off your off your, your life. And that's most, you know, that's mostly how we live. And uh, people that are uh, extremely uh, impacted by this virus, they may remember infections before they may not. So I just want you to see that we all have it and carry it regardless. Uh, here are some big deals, uh, uh, big issues in medical practice. We have inaccurate, outdated information, um, not corresponding to medical literature. Unfortunately, I'm not blaming anyone. Doctors do not know. And millions of people fall through these cracks and they spiral, they go from doctor to doctor. I see these people, I listen to their stories. It is, it is demoralizing. I am so frustrated with it. I'm just viewing that I'm not criticizing anyone. It is what it is. Mono is considered as self-limiting. Yes, for most people, but not for all, not for those complex cases that we, that come to us. This is the only EBV presentation that is acknowledged in medical, traditional medical practice. There's no understanding that EBV can become chronic. That's where the big issue is. Antiviral medications and botanical medicine, it is a mismatch in my experience, based on what I see, based on the research, based on um, the reports from people that have loved their doctors and they've worked two, three years trying to figure out EBV and it's not really, they're still not functional. That's not good enough. So 
um, I probably, I hope I have time to, to discuss that more. And testing, testing is the biggest issue. We're gonna to touch upon the basics, just hold on to that basic that will carry you a long way. We have a lot of free uh, resources, free trainings actually on our, on our website for consumers and doctors, you can plug into that. But it's very poorly tested. And even worse is the interpretation. I'm going to I'm going to spend some time on that because that's very important. Here's the common things that doctors say and do, and you know the 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 benefit I have over anyone else is because I started to I walked away from everything else I was doing and I just exclusively started to work with EBV and that really simplified my life, but also made me more in tuned into everything EBV, starting to see patterns and predictability, you know, and a lot of stories. And so commonly people knocked to on many doors until they find a doctor willing to test because mostly here's what they will say. Everyone has antibodies. It's a waste of time and money. I'm not gonna test you for EBV. You're looking at the wrong thing. Your medical conditions have nothing to do with EBV. You just need an antidepressant, you know, start exercising to improve your mood, which is the worst. The wor exercise is the worst. Um, that's where people crash and burn. Uh, or you only have mono once and you get over it and that's it for ABV. You can't get mono again. This is really bad information and it's not rooted in medical literature. Your labs are fine. You only had it in the past, like most of us. I'm going to discuss that because that's the number one mistake in medical practice and also in lab sets, the way the labs are set. Okay, so it's not entirely doctor's fault of not knowing. The labs are not set to provide all markers. It's a big issue. You have to insist, insist with the lab. You have to make sure that they give you all because uh, automatically they usually won't. Stop reading about it on the internet. It's just a hype. You know, doctors are, aren't you aware of medical medium and all the hype it created? It actually made me think. I had to read his book because a couple of patients asked me about my educated opinion. It's like, oh, okay. So I had to read it on a, on a plane to a medical conference. And I was floored because I said, even if half of it is true, these are my patients. This is where I hit the wall. So it was like, Yes, there is a hype, there is this discrepancy, you know, big gap between medical community and the medical medium. My job was to bridge it and just bring, you know, validate what do we know and then go from there. That's how I started. And then the typically what doctor will say, just rest, sleep and wait, there's nothing else you can do. And after a few weeks, typically six, eight weeks, you'll be back on your feet and living your life. Yes and no. Yes, there's really nothing that doctors know what to do. And yes, for most people, you will be functional and go about your life at that point. Maybe in future, you won't. It's not a solution. And, you know, I've had people waiting because the doctor said so in hospital with viral encephalitis to the point where one of our students lost hearing in one ear and there was still asking her to wait and see while her other hearing in the other ear was starting to deteriorate. So instead she, she joined us and, um, and the rest is history. We, we stopped that deterioration. So this is not good enough because some people will actually progress into more chronic illnesses, chronic fatigue, autoimmunity, and so on. If you don't have mono, you don't have EBV. Well, that's really not factual. As we said, most people have had it. We have it. I had it, didn't know it. I was one of those people, uh, probably in this uh, statement, some research suggests that multiple EBV infections are actually common even in healthy individuals as well. I think I am one of those individuals. Now I can track it with my left ear. That's a different story. Um, as I said, the only recognizable form is mononucleosis, also called infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever, depending on the country. Incubation about six weeks. Healthy asymptomatic people continue to shed it intermittently, months after their acute infection, fluctuating over time, which means, do you have concerns that people are uh, contagious? Yes, always, but like I said, we can have so many spouses, you know, I have so many married people in our community and it doesn't mean that their spouse has EBV. Very seldom, it doesn't mean it. 
Um, severity of infection increases with age, especially after the age of 40. I think there's a combination of reasons. We're going to talk about hormonal changes as a triggering event, but also at that age, you start, you know, you you start having a lot more responsibilities. The parents are aging. There's like uh, for a woman in the States, she's so stretched thin and the virus is opportunistic, opportunistic. If there's anything I want you to remember is that word. And so it's going to get you at that point because you become more vulnerable, tired, overstretched. We know that it is an epidemic because this is all statistic. There are 3 million cases of mono in the States alone diagnosed annually. These are the reported cases. How many people don't end up going to the doctor? They just linger in bed, miserable, right? There's probably more. This is just in one country. And just to give you a perspective, up to 18% of gastric carcinoma is linked to EBD directly. 200,000 cases of cancer LA, a year globally directly caused by EBV. It's oncogenic. We're going to talk about that a little bit. In 2010, this is the last statistic I found, so it's old, 143,000 died from cancer caused by EBV globally. Let's talk about the chronic aspect of mono. It should be self-limiting, at least in most cases. Well, of course, not for our patients because we do have concepts of chronic mononucleosis and chronic mononucleosis syndrome. And actually, when you look at literature, and it's more in my book, you have a very close match between chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic active EBV. So you got a screen. So here's the definition of chronic mono, weakness, aching legs, low grade fever, sometimes intermittent and depression. Depression, and I'm thinking Hashimoto's, depression, Hashimoto's, caused by EBV as well, like, hmm. Also headaches, myalgia, persistent fatigue, lymphado, lymphadio, <laughs> lymphadenopathy, engorged or enlarged lymph. That's very often a problem. Prolonged recovery period that takes more than the typical months plus. So you have cases when people have to step away from college, uh, take sabbatical from their clinical practice. We have a lot of practitioners that get sick. Uh, young professionals that have to move back uh, into their their parents' home because they they can't provide for themselves anymore. They they just uh, bed bedridden. There are some uh, some diagno some uh, definitions of what uh, chronic uh, active EBV is, how you diagnose it. Number one, persistent or recurrent symptoms of mono, and then unusual patterns of antibodies. I don't think they are unusual, but that's what they say, raised uh, VCA, IgG, and early antigen. Uh, this is a kissing disease. So the entry is right there. Nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, laryngeal, endothelial through tonsils. So if tonsils are infected, it's either a strep probably or EBV or both. Bodily fluids, primarily saliva. Blood transfusion uh, is not screened for EBV, unfortunately. The biggest uh, symptoms will be fatigue, brain fog, myalgia, fever, rashes, swollen lymph glands, sore throats, that you keep people, people can't move it, pharyngitis, enlarged spleen or liver. Uh, what you'll hear is, this is where you want to ask the question, is it how you feel, the worst flu of your life? Do you feel like you've been hit by a truck? This is how people feel. So in terms of fatigue, this is, this is what you want to hear. When a person tells you, I can drag myself from my bedroom into the kitchen, this is all the energy I have, that's it, I'm spent. Or the brain fog is to the point where they feel like they're losing their marbles, they're, they forget, they can't study, they can't finish a sentence, they feel like they have the beginning of Alzheimer. And commonly they will be bedridden for periods of time because they just can't, they just barely, that's just like in this picture, that's how they feel. This is what EBV really means, chronic EBV, it's awful. Uh, this is just, in the middle, you have numbers of prevalence percentage-wise. On the left, common signs and some common uh, comments on the right. So you can read that later. Of, of um, interest is um, uh, spleen enlargement is 33%. It, it looks like mostly in, in young boys for some reason. Sometimes adult women I've seen, but it's not very frequent. But look at that. Headaches are 75% common, but underappreciated. Who knew, right? Fatigue, so throat are common, of course. Fever is quite common, body aches. I would say body aches are more than 50%. And so all kinds of 
uh, typical presentations, uh, liver, spleen, fever, uh, pharyngitis. So right here <clears throat> and problems there. But there is a whole bucket of very unusual presentations. And I could spend an hour just on these because trust me, when people reach out to me from all walks of life, from different countries, they tell me their stories. And then I go to PubMed and pull some, uh, you know, uh, random rare autoimmune disorder that somebody mentioned as part of their bucket. I go to PubMed and I research and I see that there's links to EBV. I've done it so many times that nothing surprises me anymore. So I, I'm not listing everything. These are just examples to pay attention to because they are uh, frequent. And actually I have a free quiz for practitioners you can get where I have all these common, less common, unusual symptoms, like four pages of checklists so people can see their trajectory and see, oh, I may actually have EBV I didn't realize. So here's an example, sensitivity to mosquito bites, very well documented in medical literature. Uh, vertigo, I actually, this was my symptom uh, at a certain opportunity that the virus had, nosebleeds, ataxia, tinnitus is very frequent, uh, eyelid edema, who knew, deafness I already mentioned to you, post-exercise intolerance, this is huge. People that crash after even a little bit of exercise, that's typical, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit later if I have time why. Jaundice, of course, many types of cancer, autoimmunity, and so on, so forth, so on, so forth. Uh, this is a screenshot from two pages of my book. Uh, let me just um, zoom out again, just give you a concept. There are misdiagnosed, this is all medical studies, this is not my opinion. There are misdiagnosed uh, cases. Uh, one of them is Lyme disease, I'm sorry to say. You know, I'm not claiming anything, but it is possible. Crohn's disease, I've seen it too. Ulcerative colitis. Uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, about 60, 62% of those cases, according to studies, have been triggered by EBV. Who knew, right? I couldn't believe it. Then autoimmune disorders, these are not at all inclusive. There's many more. Uh, this was like the base, basic ones. Uh, from the studies I did <laughs> search uh, when I was writing the book. So uh, what I want you to pay attention to is celiac, actually chronic fatigue, you already know, diabetes step one, uh, Hashimoto's, please, 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 any woman with low thyroid, you have responsibility to test her for Hashimoto's as well. And then automatically you should test them for EBV because I feel from all the triggers of Hashimoto's, EBV is number one. And if you don't work on EBV, if you're working with Hashimoto's, you know, if you work with EBV, you will have much faster results. Um, Shorgans is classic. Now at the bottom, you have lupus. Lupus is classic for chronic EBV. That's very classic, very classic, very straightforward. On the other side here, brain related, you know, a lot of deterioration. Um, the brain can impact the brain. We don't have time for that today, but look at the look at the conditions. Um, now, Parkinson's is just a hypothesis. So, you know, Parkinson's is complicated. And then there's specific cancer types like Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma we talked about, stomach cancer. Now there's studies on color, colorectal and uh, breast cancer. I'll share some examples. Um, the one that I wanted to pay attention is papillary thyroid cancer noma. That is not as uncommon as you would think in women. Um, and so if somebody has already gone through that, had the thyroid removed, you wanna pursue EBV as well. And then gastrointestinal co-infections, a lot of them like H. pylori. We have a lot of SIBO in, uh, in our community as well. Okay. 15% of global cancer burden can be linked to oncogenic tumor viruses, and EBV is very well studied to be oncogenic, as you see so saw on the, in the list. Um, so basically, the B cells become like cancer cells. They keep replicating. They can become neoplastic. Um, yeah, there, there's some studies in colorectal cancer. Here's some examples of breast cancer. Some some researchers say that the, the evidence is very strong. Some said it's missed depending on the quality of the study and so on and so forth. But we have some kind of relationship. Uh, the virus was restricted to tumor cells. 
and was more frequently associated with the most aggressive tumors in the, the breast, for example. So there is that. Let's talk about autoimmunity. You, you saw a laundry, law, laundry list, which was not all inclusive, like I said. The biggest one is chronic fatigue syndrome, of course, very well established that it can follow an acute viral infection. Studies of patients with infectious mono caused by EDD show that a small percentage will not recover from post-infection fatigue and will develop chronic fatigue. That's our population right there. <coughs> There was a wonderful study by Dr. Harley just a few years ago. He mapped out seven uh, autoimmune disorders that can be triggered by this one little EBD NA2 protein from the virus. So in the infected B cells, <clears throat> they will go into the nucleus and mess up with the, with the DNA areas for autoimmunity. Here we go. Rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. I've seen cases of these, celiac, I just mentioned MS, uh, lupus, I mentioned in type one diabetes. Let's move on to prescription antivirals. They don't have high efficacy. Um, so I do ask practitioners and they complain about that. So they try to, you know, patch it together with botanicals and supplements and they get very frustrated. But if you look at literature, it's really low efficacy and I also say, in the, in the years I've worked with EBV, um, I've only heard a couple of cases, literally a couple of cases when people would say, you know, the prescription medication for the virus, turn me around, I'm stable. I have heard those, but it is just a few. And we have some studies to, to support that, that generally ineffective for the disease. Uh, glucocorticoids and antivirals do not reduce the length or severity of the illness. And I still see people put on these medications. Now, glucocorticoids, it's a, it's a different story. These medications are probably the worst for EBD because they turn off your immune system and that's the opportunity the EBD will piggyback on. So you wanna ask your patients if they've ever had to take uh, cort cortical steroids, and if they did, ask them if they felt like they had the worst case of EBD or like the, the track hit them over the head. Uh, a kind of consistent story, not for everyone. Sometimes glucocorticoids can give you a honeymoon period when people feel better, but longer term, they're just gonna trigger EBV reactivation. So let's talk about testing as promised. So the problem is, you know, what do you test and what do you do with the test results? Because in medical practice, the common knowledge is there's nothing to do. You just wait and sleep and rest, right? Uh, which is not, not good enough from where I stand. And that mono is self-limiting. So there's so much resistance to testing. So let's talk about the testing. When you test for EBV, I need you to check the labs you're using. And I need you to see if there are three, two, three, or four antibodies in the panel. Typically, there are two or three. And you have to insist on the other ones, especially early antigen IgG right here on the line. This is the one that is typically not part, whoops, not part, whoops, <laughs> sorry, not part of the, the, the lab panel. You need four. If you just need have three, you can't diagnose anything. You just, you're not gonna know. Another thing is do not waste your time on PCR because it can be false negative. It's only more appropriate for the initial infection. The chances of, chances of you working with a patient coming to you that, that, that has the initial EBV activation are very slim. Most people in your clinical practice are those with chronic EBV that now have it's manifested into one or more autoimmune disorders, chronic fatigue or whatnot. PCR will present a false negative so many times in recurring infection. And this is looking for the DNA of the virus in the blood. But what you need to know is that the virus leaves the blood as soon as the lysis are, are out of your B cells, it travels in the blood, but uses it as a taxi the destination is organ systems, organs, glands, 
not the bloodstream. So you will miss it. You would have to test PCR during reactivation. It can be one or two weeks window only that you have. So it's not worth it. Uh, there's also confusion between IgG and IgM. And I have one graph for you and you will understand it. I'm going to walk through it right now, as you can see. IgG, technically, we understand that it's in the past and IgM, it's present. It's not as black and white with EBV. The early antigen that I mentioned is the most important one you want to remember. This one right here, that's why I underlined it. And it's IgG, however, it is the current reactivation. Okay. So because of this mess, people are falling through the cracks for years and are misdiagnosed, mistreated wrong medications, wrong therapies. <clears throat> and this is why you may be hitting the, the wall. So <clears throat> this is the only slide, if, if, if any, I want you to keep and take a screenshot, take a picture, memorize it. I am visual, so that was the time when I got it. So let's walk through the four antibodies. I'm gonna focus first on the two big ones, the red and the green the VCA IgG and EBNA IgG. Some people have both, some people have one of them. Some people don't make one of them. But once they are elevated, they are there for the lifetime of the host. <clears throat> you will live and die and die with them. They will never go to zero, it's not expected. They will fluctuate with reactivation. So on the right, you see years below and you see the little bubble reactivation below they will increase if you like to test and retest, test and retest. You wanna test a person when they feel like they've been hit by the truck. You don't wanna test them two months later. You're gonna miss early antigen. <laughs> As you can see, it's, it's short lived. So people fluctuate, you know, uh, people can fluctuate. Women can fluctuate with their menstrual cycles if they have really bad EBV. It can just, it can reactivate with that. So that's monthly. Uh, but it can, it's opportunistic, so you never know when it will reactivate. It's just, it's, it's an opportunist and it will grab an opportunity. But early antigen is the one that will reactivate and the, the red and the green will kind of wave upwards as well during that time. Uh, so that's what it is. You can have an amazing functional life with these elevated and you will be fine as long as you, you know what to do, how to protect yourself from the virus so you, you have a good baseline. So early antigen is the blue one. It will, um, it will activate during the initial infection shortly. And then every time you reactivate, that's the one you need. And that's the one, again, it's not typically in the panels. You have to ask them, you have to insist, they have to add it. Sometimes they won't and everybody's frustrated. Now you know. Now the, the IgM, the early IgM in this picture is VCA. And that's the initial infection. It is short lived. It's not going to, even though uh, on the right it says years, you can see it bumping up a little bit. We don't see that. It's not enough to show. And so there's very rare cases of this being elevated every single time for a person with chronic EBV. And that's an indication of something else. And I'll address that. We have a summary. So hopefully this makes sense to you. That's the one you want to always refer to when you interpret your labs. And I have tons of free resources and, and 15 minutes of me on the whiteboard going into all kinds of nitty gritty of it, if you want, on our website. It's, it's available for everyone free. And this is kind of uh, what I already said. Now, if that VCA IgM, the black one, is elevated again and again and again, what do we have? Up, up. I can't see. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, you have about 26 um, minutes. So. All right. So let's keep going. I basically said what I needed to say. What does research say? If you have chronic illness that can be explained by other disease processes at diagnosis, you need to test for chronic EBV. And if you have idiopathic cases, you need to test. And if you do a protocol and you know what should happen and it doesn't happen, they fail, you hit the wall, that's where, that's where you pursue EBV. I think I'm gonna skip that. This is like infection. The B cells basically become immortalized. Um, the biggest thing is that other viruses provide the, the, the infected cells an opportunity to uh, for apoptosis, you know, the kamikaze. These cells do not die actually. So they become immortal a little bit like, uh, a little bit like uh, 
cancer cells, right? So when, when the viruses, we call them virons, are ready to spill, that's the lysing. And that's the opportunist, that's the opportunity, that's where we have triggering events that I'm going to talk about. The cool thing is that people don't know that the, the lysing is just anecdotal, but it's the latency where you have all these undercurrent cells that are infected now growing. It's like factories of the young virus. That's the mechanisms that sustain the virus. So latent mechanisms are responsible for sustained infections. It relies more on clonal replication on infected B cells for maintenance of uh, the infection. And then, like I said, it's opportunistic. It can switch from one to the other anytime it's called pleomorphic. And so in my, my practice, I just want to arrest that, uh, clean people's lifestyle, provide all the protocols. And the bottom line for us is that we are we have the ability with the protocols to turn off the virus within 48 hours so it doesn't go into full reactivation and people are functional. Uh, well, my favorite thing is we'll travel because the, the virus goes into all kinds of you know areas in your body. These are some of the target organs, it could be thyroid, liver, central nervous system, brain, you know, connective tissue, vagus nerve, vagus nerve, brain, vestibular, ear nerve, and so on and so forth, reproductive issues. All right, um, let me see here. So immune system, <clears throat> there are mechanisms in which the EBV turns off the signaling, so the other immune cells do not recognize that the B cells are infected and need to be terminated. It's just very smart like that. Uh, now, NF-kappa B is huge because this is what uh, the virus uses to replicate. Uh, it hijacks it. And so there is a pathway to do that. I'm going to talk about this more because it's easy to increase it and it's easy to uh, downgrade it. And we, you have, we have a lot of, uh, lot of tools here. Um, transactivation is a common, um, common, well, I talked about the bucket. And transactivation in medical literature means that co-infections are common. I mentioned strep, I mentioned SIBO, sometimes H. pylori, we see these. So that's the bucket full. And let's talk about triggers, the opportunities for the EBV. I always joke that we compete with astronauts because they do get, I talked to NASA scientists once, they said, yep, we know there is a higher risk of reactivation in space. So we provide them with antiviral medications. That's what they do. College loneliness, overtraining, physical, physiological, spiritual, mental, emotional stress, surgeries, lack of sleep, grief, loss, divorce, anything that really hits a person on a, on a deep level, that stress, that's what feeds the virus, it will reactivate. Also, poor nutrition. As your nutritional status decreases, the virulence of your virus decreases, the virulence of your virus increases. It's very well uh, studied. And there's particular nutrients that you can put in PubMed like selenium, and they will show you the EBV up and down depending on the status. Uh, the population with chronic EBV, they didn't come with chronic EBV. The chronic EBV is kind of the result of everything else that happened in their life, including uh, adrenal insufficiency induced by chronic stress and chronic trauma. So people are very sensitive to glucose. They have to have steady meals. They have to have a, a schedule. They have to have a rich, complex carbohydrates very important uh, glu glucose regulation. The, the problem with EBV is that it creates massive oxidative stress. Um, and if you add to it rancid oils, exercise, which induces oxidative stress naturally, lack of antioxidants, pollution, you have the tipping point when you have so much oxidative stress and it feels like chronic fatigue and it feels like malaise and it feels like your brain is foggy and you have Alzheimer's. All that is like adding to the oxidative stress from the virus itself. And we talked about nf -kappa B. Here's a study. This is a McDonald's breakfast. It, uh, it increased nf -kappa B for two hours by 150%. So that alone, like we talked about, um, and f kappa B, that can reactivate your EBV. <clears throat> Hormonal changes in your life are huge. They're prime triggering events. I would, I would especially pay attention to postpartum when women after the childbirth 
have depression, uh, I would immediately test for Hashimoto's and EBV combined because most likely EBV is trickling into, you know, is getting into the thyroid and you have that perfect storm for women. Uh, cortisol, adrenaline, stress is prime. We already talked about that. Uh, chemicals, man-made environmental chemicals in general can reactivate EBV. The biggest ones are dioxins. Uh, so we have burning forests right now, wood burning, uh, burning debris, fireworks also, car exhaust. We actually uh, remind our community every early July to stay away from fireworks and so on and so forth. Environmental toxins uh, that are big and understated, unfortunately, is EMF, Wi-Fi technology. This is one, we don't have enough studies, but I can tell you from the experience, it is bad. And this is how I developed uh, vertigo. It was a combination of molds I didn't know, a smart meter I moved into waiting to be removed and um, and EBV, all that, that is a bad combo. There is a study from 1990s, 50 Hertz. 50 Hertz is a computer, uh, desktop computer without Wi-Fi, way before the time uh, that expressed early antigen already. And the common symptoms of that are vertigo, tinnitus, a lot of tinnitus, a lot of uh, ear problems. Now, if you add mold, it's even worse, trust me. There is a hypothesis by Dr. Yasko, if you wanna go deeper into it, into heavy metals and bacteria, heavy metals and, um, and viruses. She claims mercury has affinity and in particular uh, to viruses. So if you don't clear viruses, the heavy metals will be hard to get rid of and kill it. It's interesting. Now that's a big, that's a picture from one of the houses I had to remediate. <laughs> You'll have to remove mold. And if a person like if, in my protocol, if it doesn't work, we're looking for other things like EMF and mold right away. If you have a mold and EBV, these are most, your most complex cases. You have mold, EBV and EMF. These are even worse cases. The easiest thing to do is number one, turn down the volume on EMF because that's the easiest for people. And then as you do that, look for sources uh, for mold, making sure that you exclude it from the list. You do not have to be immunodeficient. You just have to be depleted in your life journey to, uh, to get EBD. Like my story is very common. I was perfectly fine uh, until I get mold after mold after mold, very expensive move after move, less than a year, three years, three houses, all with mold. Um, we talked about glucocorticoids as the worst therapy. And here's the proof, treatable and reversible. Dr. Flaving, amazing woman. She had a case of 50 boys with enlarged spleen. It took her about uh, 48 hours. This was acute uh, to turn it around. And, you know, until this day, hospitals do not want to hear about this. When I talk to her, it's heartbreaking. They don't care that this is totally treatable. So let's talk quickly about what we do. We talked about a lot of the air areas here. I'm gonna go real fast because I want you to see the pattern and don't get stuck on details. You're gonna see repetition, repetition, repetition. I'm gonna to point to one thing we haven't talked, a lower uh, left uh, corner, better boundaries for perfectionists and empaths because that, that actually, these personalities induce overstress overburdening themselves, overworking, poor boundaries. So you have to pay attention to these. Oftentimes they're healers. They're very sensitive. They're like hunters in the, in the woods, in the mind. Uh, I had an opportunity to grow up in Poland where every year we would uh, forage for wild blueberries fresh. Here I'm eating wild blueberries uh, in a Polish forest somewhere and mushrooms. Uh, very different experience and nutritional makeup from what we get now. It's really important what people put in their mouth. These are just, this is like a map. We're going to go over each one pretty fast. Directly antiviral support, selenium, licorice, lysine, zinc, lemon balm. Uh, licorice has to be the real licorice, not DGL. DGL has no antiviral qualities. Uh, Anti-replication, we have a couple of different pathways. Let's start with direct anti-replication support, lipoic acid, 
vitamin D, curcumin, chrysanthemum. NAC is general. We don't have studies for EBV, but boy, it's a heavy hitter for EBV in many different ways. Digestion, monolaurin breaks the envelope of the virus. I do not work with monolaurin for many reasons. If you want to know more, maybe you can ask me questions. It's not worth it. It's very well established that DNA methylation plays a critical role in EBV gene silencing. The studies so far are, are on folinic acid B12, vitamin D again, betaine, NAC again, less than B6. Exercise, however, hold off exercise, not good for EBV at all. And then reducing NF kappa B. I told you it's junk food increases it, but we have tons of things that decrease them. Here's some of them. People have them in the kitchen, in the fridge, in their spices. Very easy. These are nutrients. So when you want, you want to take a screenshot of that, that's fine. Recognizable. You you know all of these, right? Very nice. Moving to immuna, immune support for the cells. This is from based on Dr. Alex Vasquez. Um, minerals like zinc again, omegas, again, vitamin D, A, C, glutathione, NAC, selenium, alpha lipoic acid, glutamine, lactoferrin, probiotics, melatonin. Do we use all of them? No. We go for the big ones. Mitochondrial support because the virus hits mitochondria, targets them. Melatonin, MCT, hydroxycobalamin, that's a form of B12. Coenzyme Q10, magnesium, B vitamins, iron, sulfur, uh, omega-3, vitamin C. Again and again. Detoxification, please be gentle. Don't jump the gun. This is a very delicate community, so slow and steady. Glutathione, selenium, and AC, glycine, cabbage family, garlic family, clean water, clean air, Wi-Fi hygiene, and B vitamins are crucial for any detoxification daily. Single nutrients, we don't have many studies actually, but here's the winners, vitamin C, D, vitamin A, carotenoids. Vitamin A is huge. Carotenoids are limited. I wouldn't focus on them because some women cannot convert them into vitamin A. So just straight vitamin A. Botanicals, turmeric, licorice, uh, reishi. I use uh, you know, direct beta-glucans because that's the reason reishi mushrooms and other medicinal mushrooms are so uh, beneficial for EBV. Olive leaf extract, we use it sparingly because it's very strong for other co-infections and ginger. I have an entire blog on my website about different uh, uh, teas. Um, they are fantastic because then every time you open your mouth, you're doing something antiviral and herbal teas are where my botanical medicine comes in. This is how far I go. Licorice and this. Otherwise, it's not really worth it uh, for me. The only things I would caution you is licorice not with high blood pressure, nettle not with high iron, dandelion root and dandy blunt not with SIBO, uh, rosehip, hibiscus not with uh, hemochromatosis, green tea not with Hashimoto's, peppermint not with heartburn. <laughs> but you know, that's it. There's some wonderful studies on the active constituents of, uh, of green tea. And this is how close I can, I can come today to the protocol, the starter protocol we use. We're very aggressive with the dosages though, um, with every new students. Uh, nutrition slash antioxidant value, multitasker, zinc, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, uh, amino acids, NAC, lysine. The only herb that is worth it is, therapeutically for me is licorice. Uh, and immune system beta-glucans. That's the foundation. And then the last one is food. So let's talk about diets. <clears throat> let's talk about what not to do. Low FODMAP is specifically for SIBO. It is not long-term for SIBO either. It's not appropriate for us. We don't need it. So it's a mismatch. Low carb for this population. Remember we talked about adrenal insufficiency. Low carb is a very bad diet for that population. Autoimmune paleo and paleo, it's too restrictive. We're, we're removing the, the legumes. We're removing uh, gluten-free grains. They have a lot of capacity to rebuild your immune system in your gut. So if people cannot tolerate these food groups, we need to heal. We need to look deeper. These are not evil food groups. I can see how much up. Okay. Intermittent ketogenic diet is one of the worst for this population. Intermittent fasting is not appropriate. This is where people really get worse. High in animal products, not appropriate. Restricting fruits. We are a fruitophobic country. 
um, medical practitioner, prof professionals, gastroenterologists tell their patients to stop eating fruits. I literally hear that. It's very unfortunate. If a bad body cannot tolerate any fruits, that's not the fruit problem, that the person's problem. We have to heal the gut and support them. What do we use? Whole foods, organic, mostly plant-based, gluten-free home cooked grain, uh, legumes, properly cooked. You can cook out lectins with pressure cooking. Some grains do not have any lectins, like millet and quinoa, I believe. Vegetables, fruits, culinary herbs and spices you saw in NF Kappa B. We have a lot of opportunity in teas. We have a lot of opportunities, hot teas, uh, sipped with meals. And what pot, one pot meals when you throw everything in a soup. We, we love this concept in our community. Stay away from dairy, stay away from eggs. We talked about gluten. We have uh, on the EBV help, we have blogs about diets, about antioxidants, about eggs in particular. All you know, you have all of that on the website. Here's a cheat sheet, two pages of what we've just gone through. And you can see the repeated, 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 repeated nutrient. That's why that's where we start. Um, and expectations on when you can heal the person with EBV. <clears throat> it depends. If 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 I if I'm lucky, if I have just EBV, we can start turning around the symptoms within sometimes three weeks, sometimes less. I don't want to overpromise. Um, sometimes a couple of months, sometimes a year, but oftentimes it's the bucket. So you have to strip. You know, is there mold? Wi-Fi, heavy metals, leaky gut, you know, candida, all kinds of stuff. That's why I said you prime for it because you have all these components that you're familiar with. Uh, these are some of the resources, again, abvhelp.com. We have consumer recovery program, which is where I learned the most about what happens in people's life. We have EBV practitioner workshop and we have a mentoring program. Uh, the workshop is a prerequisite to that. Um, and we have the book uh, on Amazon and I am under time. So I have seven minutes for questions. <laughs> so I am sorry I was running through it. Um, so what is next? And the next pages are just uh, references. So you can, you know, and there wow, are that, that was impressive. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Two summary pages, oh, the two summary pages, the orange ones with the... Okay, let's go back. Yeah. Great, and I have time for that. I think, yeah, I think people want to take some screenshots. I'm going to tell you this one. Let, let's go back to this one again. This one. This is where you start. Zinc, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E. Vitamin A, straight. Vitamin C, use vitamin C with bioflavonoids not the you know buffered don't add calcium to that that junky calcium in vitamin c the bioflavonoid is going to take that vitamins uh into a different level nac lysine you can be aggressive um lysine not with kidney disease that's or high cholesterol you don't want to go aggressive licorice is fantastic not dgl you can be pretty aggressive. I have a lot of dosages in my books as well. Um, so this is like this is like your foundation and vitamin D, of course, with K2. And then going back here, they're gonna pop in everywhere again and again, the ones that I mentioned. I see someone's taking pictures, so hold that there. Yeah. Everybody got that one? Okay, next one. The beauty is in how aggressive you are, honestly. So that, that's the, that's why I can't really, because I, I work one on one, so I have to get to know, you know, all the contraindications and stuff, because we okay. go as aggressive as is safe. I think we have one question. I see David Nibbling at the microphone over there. Yes. Um, why uh, no uh, organic fertilized eggs? Ah, oh, that's a lot of questions. So components of eggs, egg proteins have been used in in vaccinations for many years. So there's a risk, there's a blog I wrote about that and there's a little bit about that in the book as well. I, you know, I don't wanna get into vaccination and all that, but that's one layer when the, the, the signaling can be tricky with immune system, that can be triggering effect. But we also, um, eggs are highly allergenic 
and we've been overexposed to them, not the organic safe ones. And I can say, I would say about 80%, maybe more in our population really uh, feel much better when they, when they have chronic EBV and they take the eggs out. So I always recommend take it out, clean it up. Sometimes it's confirmed in labs. And then once you have your functionality back, once you're cruising, once you have your live back, you can reintroduce it. I teach it properly. So you know without a doubt that you can handle eggs once in a while, but not as a staple every day. I would never recommend that. Not eggs. Not to anyone. It's just, you know, it's just uh it's just it is what it is. Um the entire blog is on ebvhelp.com. Just go there. It's a, there's more scientific uh, research. And there was one study on eggs and EBV in particular. It's in there. Good question. Um, Kasha, um, I saw on your website that you're doing another webinar, like in a couple of weeks, I think. Is that for doctors or is that for patients? Well, we made a decision that we're focusing on the people. We have all the resources for clinicians, but I just don't have the resources to do more. But we have webinars pre-recorded for practitioners that are free. There should be there on our website. Everything is probably from, from our EBV help website. You can, you can find things. We have a lot of webinars of free resources and weekly trainings for the global community. We have a free Facebook group. So we talk about steroids, we talked about traveling with EBV, we talk about mold, we talk about labs, we talk about you know one topic at a time, 10 minutes. So every Wednesday at, at 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm okay. on Facebook Live. Is there a fee for those classes? Or? No. Okay. It's and so go to ebvhelp.com. So the Facebook group is called Dr. Kine's EBV Community. Oh, Dr. Kine's EBV, EBV community. community. Okay, we have one other question about. from another doctor. Go ahead. Can you comment on the licorice dosing? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, I like to use drops. And so we do two full droppers three times a day or three full droppers twice a day, you know, and we watch, you know, you, you want to go over the list of contraindications and then you want to watch the symptoms of uh, rapid heartache, anxiety, heart beat, anxiety being, you know, um, over stimulated and you avoid it in the evening. I would recommend if you have concerns with uh, licorice to start with licorice tea earlier in the day. Licorice is fantastic for EBV, fantastic. It has, beta, it has um, gamma interferon, um, which is very important. It is also very so soothing for the, for the gut. <clears throat> so it has many, many benefits for adrenal insufficiency. So it can buffer those poor adrenals and give people a little oomph, uh, unlike co co coffee and caffeine. So it has so many benefits. It fits perfectly into our community. We don't have many people with high blood pressure. Mostly we have people with low blood pressure. It comes with the territory, if it makes sense, yeah, right? Adrenal insufficiency, yeah. <laughs> um, so it really is time for our question and answer panel, but I do want to, to encourage all of you to watch the webinars because probably one of them is the EBV webinar that I did with you, right? It was yeah. a small group of people. Yeah, it was very good. And she does talk about dosing and things like that. <clears throat> I did end up uh, making a chart based on what you taught us in that. And she has a jumpstart protocol, which I think you talk about in your book. I wasn't, is, yeah, kind of. We develop it after the book. You know, book is 2017, 18. So okay. Yeah, so you, got, you kind of really hit it hard for a month and then you kind of wean down on stuff, but you're constantly monitoring the patient and yeah. having them redo their EBV questionnaire to help them through it. I'll just tell you real quick before we start the panel, I had a guy who had uh, came in, was tired. He was my carpet cleaner <laughs> and he used all natural water-based system, but he was always tired all the time. Hadn't felt good since he was in his twenties and he was almost around 50. And I started him on testosterone because he was low. And uh, the next check, I always do a PSA with the hormones. The hormones were better, but his PSA was up. I send him to the urologist, he has prostate cancer. And then he starts telling me more about his chronic fatigue. <laughs> so I check his EBV. 
he now this is one thing I want to clarify not everybody are you going to catch with the early antigen you made that very clear to me Kasha when I did your seminar um, you're going to get people that they have a bunch of positives on the questionnaire but it's just the IgG BCA and IgG EBNA and that's where your clinical judgment has to come in and it's like okay they have all the symptoms they have the two lingering IgGs and a lot of these people they're they're over 600 so <laughs> we haven't even talked about so, that yet that's a yeah so we treated this guy we did the jump start protocol for like a month and a half and then I kind of weaned him down on the supplements and literally he's my best case Two months later, he told me he hasn't felt this good in a couple of decades. So yeah, he was a huge success. And I feel in my heart that his prostate cancer in part was from the EBV. I know, I know it was. And I feel like, you know, the thing that hit me when I did the seminar is I had no idea, like clueless, that this was related to autoimmune cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. And I think you had a friend, Kasha, didn't you, that had MS? That you treated? That's how, yes, she she lost her bottle 20 years into it. And uh, after I lost her, I actually asked a, a colleague who was a medical intuitive uh, because I started to hear about this virus. It's like, what was it? What triggered it? Why her? And she confirmed it was EBV. The researchers state oftentimes that uh, EBV is a prerequisite for MS. MS is complicated, but it's a prerequisite. Right. And so that's a different story. We have an entire training on MS uh, in that Facebook group recorded. And also I recently finally wrote, finally wrote a very extensive blog on EBV wow. Health with all the research because we had a scary MS slash EBV study earlier this year. So you will read all of that if you're working with MS patients right there in that blog, EBV Help. Yeah, I, I finally okay, wrote it. Great. Great. All right. Well, let's get um, the other speakers up here that spoke today. Any speakers from earlier today here? <laughs> you want chairs? Um, yeah, we probably should get some chairs. Yeah. Are you okay hanging out there, Kasha? I am here. I'm staying as long as okay. people. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We need to help these people. Back or front, Chris? Kasha, while we're gathering everybody, somebody asked me a question. You said avoid lysine with high cholesterol and kidney problems. Is that right? Yes, that's kidney disease. Yeah. Kidney disease, like nephritis or chronic yeah. kidney disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we are going to open the floor. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have one other comment and then we're going to open the floor to questions. So if you have a question for the panel, come on up here, please. All right. I just want to take a, a moment. I uh, want to, we ran out of time right after uh, John Richardson's um, presentation while the speakers are gathering here. So um, I'm in a, a big medical board thing right now. I'm working with John Richardson. And uh, instead of waiting to see how they, these things can go on for a long time. So it's interesting. Um, I, I was thinking about, especially younger people here, probably uh, haven't been, to, you know, you worry about it. Um, you know, is this going to happen to me? <clears throat> the thing, I think a couple of points I just wanted to make that, that I think are helpful. Um, uh, we've all been trained, those of you who have had training uh, with a conventional doctors, there was a lot of CYA doctors, like do everything you can not to get sued. And I always enjoyed um, training with them because I thought, thanks for showing me what you do, because I'm not going to do exactly what you do. Because, you know, they had the CYA because they just had a big A or something. I don't know. It was, it was just they had a lot of trails they wanted to cover, but that was, they were not good practitioners. You're here because you're not that kind of practitioner. You're somebody who's dedicated. You're very dedicated to the type of medicine you do, and you're not, you know, you're not thinking of legal things. You're thinking of great outcomes, and you have great outcomes. We have, I'm sure, statistically a much higher uh, success rate with our patient, much higher um, happiness rate with the patients. 
But if you get pulled into this legal thing, you know, we all fear that because, you know, we're doing something that's outside the box. And so that's a potential, that's a potential, uh, but we do it anyway. I guess I'd say a couple of things. Don't, don't hope for never uh, because you're hoping for just that it never happens. Uh, just be re ready, it may happen sometime. Easy to say, don't be overwhelmed. I was just talking to one of the docs here today who's been through this a little bit and he got to drinking too much. You know, he just knew it wasn't the right way, but you can, you can feel worried because it doesn't just end, you know, in three or four weeks. It seems scary. Uh, it is scary. But the important thing is that there's a way. And uh, working with John in my case, you need to have somebody who's a very good attorney because you're not a lawyer and you're a very good doctor. But being a doctor is not being good at being a lawyer. Now, the medical board, almost in all cases, they don't have very good lawyers either. And they don't have a lot of good doctors. So you're smarter than they are. That you are, but you have to establish that in court. And it takes some planning. So just have faith there's a way and you need to have that with a good uh, lawyer. And this other doctor I was talking to today, he said that he's not working with John on his case, although uh, he feels his lawyers, you know, very talented like John is, but he's wondering, well, you know, who's better? Hard to tell, but you need somebody of that, of that character. Um, they're, they're, both of them, uh, both lawyers have said that their strategy is you uh, annoy the medical board, you make them hate you, you make them want to pull their hair out, and they just want you to go away. And that's, that's what they do. Now, that means you've got a lawyer who knows they've got a good case, and they're going to press it. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing that John told me uh, when I was there, because I was not allowed to have representation there. I thought they'd intimidate and steamroll. That's fine. We'll do your theatrics. He coached me very well. And he said, stand in your gravitas. Stand in your power. You're the only person in this room who knows anything about what you're talking about. So don't, I, you know, I, I try to be humble because we learn better when we're humble. There's a time to toot your horn. And there's a time to, so in the settlement, when they wouldn't let him appear for me, and they said, well, you know, you, you had a reprimand once before, this isn't looking good. I said, you know what, this treatment I do, uh, this IV treatment uh, is very specialized. I've been doing it for 18 years. I've seen over 600 patients. And when people have complicated cases, they send them to me or they ask me questions. And frankly, uh, Ms. Prosecutor, your expert witness has zero experience with this treatment and will not be able to comment intelligently on it. I don't usually talk that way. <laughs> and I can see her go, <laughs> you know, a little bit later, she said, well, I'll admit Dr. Humiston does have a robust case in this part of the accusation, meaning you got your pants beat off. And sure enough, when the expert witness came out, zero experience, zero studies. And so uh, don't you think, Dr. Watson, that in your statement that, uh, that I had done an extreme departure of, from the standard of care that you were unqualified to say so? And the answer was, well, I, uh, <laughs> so see a prosecutor going like this, you know? So um, those things can happen, but you just need a lawyer to prepare you. And it's being defensive is not what you're good at. That's great. You shouldn't be good at that. You should be good at treating patients, but the, you, can, you can pour it on at the right time. I went from being, being very fearful and despairing about this. Um, you know, um, the only time in my life where you open up an email and you see the big star from the medical board or the, the state I was being involved in, they like to flash the star, the little plastic star. And uh, my heart would just race and I would start to shake. And nothing has ever done that to me. Before. Well, I wanted to ask a girl on a date in high school. That was very similar, but it wasn't as traumatizing, you know, uh, and it was a different way. But um, and I still would do that. My son noticed that, you know, shaking sometimes. Um, and uh, so, but it's gone from that to, this is actually kind of exciting. Can you believe that? I'm in the middle of it. And I want to tell you, it's kind of exciting because I've got good counsel and um, it's, there's a way to go through this. And you finally realize these people are below you as far as their, their level of accomplishment, both on the legal and the medical side. They really are because you know, you're, you're experienced, you're, you're learning and you're, you've done a lot and it's good and you can beat them uh, with the right, the le right legal, legal coach. So I guess my message was put that in your pocket for when it's gonna be needed sometime in the future. If it never is great, 
But if it does happen, it's not the worst thing in the world. And get your lawyer, get your plan. This can take two, three, four years. I've had my friends on the medical board and I, I think we've known each other for six years now. And by the last interview, I'm like, what do you want? You know, it's just like, I just got tired of it. The whole thing was such a theatric. And, um, and I don't really care how long it goes on. I really don't. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive at every turn, but they do take a long time. So this idea of, oh, I just want it to go away. I hope it's done. That's not the best way to approach it. So uh, any, if you ever in any of this type of thing, and I could give any advice or anything, other doctors have been through it, I'd be glad to help. So I just wanted to share that with you. Did, did you ever get offered a consent decree? I'm not sure what a consent decree is. Is that where you agree to uh, you, a settlement? You, you agree to whatever they say. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, it guilt. Yes, I, I had it. I had a very weird situation that had to do with uh, illness from my son. It was actually disgusting what they did. And I'm salivating over the chance to bring that up in a federal court or a jury. And the medical board will have nothing to stand on. But I, I ended up taking the letter of reprimand because I didn't really understand the whole system. And it was, it was just disgusting. You'd be shaking your head if I told you about it. So when they said in my settlement court, they said, well, Dr. Hummison, you know, you did have a recent reprimand and now you've got those other charges. I said, yes, I did. And they're like, <laughs> what's wrong with this guy? You know, it's like, yeah, let's make it go all the way because within nine different accusations I've been given over the last five years, I have quite a, a case of selective or malicious prosecution. So keep piling it on as many rules of evidence and you know impropriety you can you can put forward it's all being recorded and this is great and you know that puts you in a very different space so no i i wasn't get but at the settlement hearing uh the prosecutor i think they had it all wrapped up they said well what's the medical board offering the prosecutor said well we're offering offering this is a great word revocation of your license with a stay and five years probation, practice monitor, 40 extra hours of CME at your expense and pay the $16,000 for the proceedings so far. No, because of all those accusations you have, there's not one factual, objectively provable uh, word in it. And yeah, before you got me and I was down, but I'm not down anymore. So let's go. Now, maybe not everybody's gonna feel that way, but you can feel that way. You get the right lawyer and that's kind of how you have to look at it. And uh, so anyway, I think that's that's helpful. So no, I didn't take that, and I'm not going to take anything from them. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for those comments. It's helpful. <laughs> Go get them. <laughs> okay. So does anybody have any questions for our amazing speakers? Dental stuff. <laughs> Energy stuff. I always have questions. So, um, Alicia, I wanted to know um, the magic wand and the AO tracker. Are those things that you, that the patient has at their house that they do, or, or do you sell them a wand and they use it on themselves? Mm -hmm. Or is this a thing you do at your office? And then I also want to know from Dr. Piotrowski, if we have, which by the way, was my mother's maiden name. We look just like can't you tell we're cousins? Um, and I uh, want to know about implantitis. Do you see it very often? And is there anything to mitigate it? So, um, Both would be the answer to that. So I, I use it often um, in my practice. I'll use it within a session. It'll be a, part of that comprehensive package. Um, but depending on what the person has going on, and honestly, if it makes sense for them financially, which a lot of times it does, it's way better for them to have it at home. They can use it every day. They don't have to come in every two weeks or once a month or whenever to use it with me. So there's both options for them. And then we, there's a lot of education with that. I do a lot of webinars, um, how to, how to interpret results, how to utilize them, how to actually follow them yourself. Um, so I teach people how to use it as well, so they can do it for themselves. Uh, Ellie, your question was about uh, implantitis. Yeah, we, we do see it in practice. I think every dentist would say, yeah, it's, it's not like the most common thing that you see, but you see it. Um, we were just in a course about it last week, and I think the hardest thing to do is to try to debride all the bacteria off every single thread that's on an implant as they become exposed, even if you, you know, create a surgical flap and try to clean it. Um, there's lasers, there's other 
you know, chlorhexidine and other things that people will use as well as manual debridement. Uh, but what we were learning uh, last week was they have special coatings that they put on implants now. It's called an SLA coating that helps the bone grow into it. It's like a micro etch on the metal. Uh, the only ones you can really debride semi easily are the ones that have full polished implants, but they don't make polished implants anymore. They all have a coating on them. So I don't think it's possible to fully debride every bacteria off of them if they start to have peri-implantitis. Usually it's a sign that you're probably going to experience a failure of the implant. So ozone, PRP, is there anything you can do to mitigate that? Lasers have been used, um, manual curatage. You could put platelet-rich fibrin and PRP around it to try to help boost like the local you know, immune system in that area. Um, but I think once you start to have it, you're, you're probably going to end up losing it because those bacteria are just so ingrained into those micropores, you, you can't get them all out. I haven't tried to treat them with ozone yet myself. Usually when people come to me for that, we're taking them out. So you, you're cutting out the whole implant and just leaving a chunk of missing bone. There's a special burr that you use based on the size of the implant. And it's called a trephine burr. You can just take it right around the implant if you know the size of the implant and just, yeah, it's a little cylinder of bone and implant that comes out. Um, there's also instruments that you can put into the head of an implant and twist it out. It just depends what you have in your armamentarium. Um, you don't have to leave it open. You can clean the bone out and then regraft it and hope to come back and fight another day later. So you can, re you can put a second implant later? If you had a healthy bone site with enough bone, yes. I have a question. Um, this is for Dr. Thompson. Um, for the salivary testing, do you have a list or is there a website or something? I mean, that's my dentist right there. So he's going to have to learn how to do it. So, but um, <laughs> for other people, where can you go to find who's doing the kind of testing that you're doing? Yeah, there's several different companies that you can use if you're here in the U.S. And uh, uh, Oral DNA is one of the probably easiest companies to work with. They're in Minnesota. So Oral DNA is a good company. Um, Direct Diagnostics is a new company that's on the, on the horizon. And uh, they create a test called HR5. So both of those tests are widely available and the cost to those HR5 for the bacteria study is about $70. Um, you can order that. You can set up your account as a physician with uh, direct diagnostics. Uh, you can also set up your account as a physician with oral DNA and you can do screening tests in your office, a 30 minute swish and spit test. And those tests are about a hundred, they're about a hundred dollars uh, and $20 shipping. So those, they're very readily available. And each of the tests, if you're ordering for bacteria, that's a different test than genetics. And that's a different test than yeast. So each one of those tests carry a price point. It's all on the website for oraldna.com. So you're suggesting we should really be doing this in our office, giving the patients the kits? Or is... yeah, I don't think there's any one company right now that provides the magic bullet answer for all the testing. So I use a variety of companies. Mm -hmm. um, Adam showed DNA Connections. And uh, the, you know, there's different different companies depending upon what you're looking for. Oral DNA speciates the virus for HPV. Fida Lab, which is a company in Seattle, they give you virus copy counts. So if you want to see what you know, if you're looking at reactivated viral lesions, they can help you with copy counts. So there's not one company that has all of that stuff available. Right. So as a integrative medicine practitioner, I could get the kits, do them on my patients. And then when I find there are oral pathogens, I could treat them and, or should I also be sending them to my local yeah, neighborhood? Yeah, you should send them to the dentist because yeah. what I found is the treatment's not so easy. You know, okay. it's, not, it's not just putting them on a rinse. Okay. And the treatment, uh, the treatment really needs to be both mechanical debridement which we have specialized instruments for that. So mechanical debridement, mm -hmm. however you do it. And then it should be pharmacotherapy. It's going to have to be some antimicrobials. It's going to be some antifungals and some other things. And if you don't do both, then you're going to fall short of the treatment goals. Mm -hmm. You won't shift. You won't be able to shift the bacteria or you won't be able to shift the biome to a healthy state, either quick enough or at all. 
So are there seminars where we can learn more of the nitty gritty of this so that when we get these tests back, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's going to be a collaboration between the local biological dentist yeah, and us. I'm on, but... I'm on faculty at the COIS Center in Seattle, Washington, and we have four day courses and two day courses for hygienists to come there. But there's several other companies and several other independent people who are out teaching disinfection protocols. But unfortunately, it's not something that's taught at dental school really right now mm -hmm. uh, to the level that. Adam's working and to the level that I'm working. So there's certain people, uh, I, I run an internet based uh, company that I disclosed before I ever came on the podium called Wellness Dentistry Network. And that's a group of dentists that have studied under us. And we have about 165 offices around the world. So if you wanted to look at the wellnessdentistrynetwork.com mm -hmm. and look at the directory, you mm -hmm. might find somebody, but we have Italy, Spain, Europe, I mean, uh, England, New Zealand, Canada, uh, US, and we're trying to get like-minded professionals to work together. And I got to tell you, you know, I, I have one inter area of interest in my practice and Adam has a different area of interest in his practice. So I can guarantee you he learned things from me today and I learned things from him today. Mm -hmm. So we need to work more together uh, about how to, you know, what we can do. And I've learned from you. And so it's, it's, this is what it's about. A work in progress. <laughs> okay, we have another question, it looks like. Yeah, Kasi, you had mentioned something about the mold connection with the Epstein bar. Do you have a simple protocol for mold or what's your favorites? I think your volume is off. We can't hear you. Gosh, you're muted. Yeah. I accidentally muted myself. Um, well, I have a 40 page PDF for our students. So if you can tell me, guide me through questions because that's a, that's a loaded question. Okay, what botanicals would you, would you use for mold or do you like for mold? No, yeah. The number one thing for mold is find the mold source. Uh, at the same time, remove yourself from that uh, space and remediate. Anything else, botanicals are not not that effective. What I would recommend is actually I'm not a I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a doctor of clinical nutrition, but I personally have been led by a fantastic uh, ND, and I've been on a, a, a uh, conservative dose, I think conservative of nystatin because it doesn't absorb systemically for over a year right now. So it's a slow process. I don't do any botanicals. I don't, botanicals, I'm not, I'm not sure why you would do that. There's bigger things that need to be done and then a very slow progressive detox, but very gentle very gentle people push too much and people get sick uh, during that process but uh you know the, the first thing is the mold itself get it out um do you I, use binders do you use binders kasha uh, you know yes you want to be gentle with those the combination of i would say a sauna and a binder combination is a good one but i have to tell you i slacked on binders and i couldn't do so so uh, sauna because my skin was the problem burning already burning so it just depends on a person um so no magic bullet but get away from the malt and oh my gosh it. i mean people live in trailers and oh it's not sexy i moved three times within three years from one house to another but two of these houses and one mold inspector missed mold here i mean it's just it is not a sexy topic it's a difficult topic, but it needs to be done. It's, it's financially and stressful, you know, draining it. And that's how I reactivated my virus, finally, because the stress and the, the insult from, from the mold was just uh, overbearing on the body. Okay, thank you. We got another Sorry. question. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Walter Crinion used to say, never underestimate the power of a mold <laughs> patient to find another mold infected mold house. To I know in. that statement. Yes, it is true. I mean, who knew? Three houses um, in a row. So I have two questions for you, Kasha. Number one is, um, do you use mold mycotoxin, urine mycotoxin testing at all? 
And number two, how do you serially test? Do you do the four blood tests periodically or you just go by symptoms once you've identified it? Does the EBV ever go away? Um, yeah. And clinically, does it correlate? Great questions. So um, I would say the best testing for mold is <laughs> the mycotoxins, uh, Great Plains is a great lab, if I may, may mention uh, names. They have the mycotoxin panel. I would confirm it with organic acid lab, especially there are a couple of markers for uh, indicative, indicative of uh, mycotoxins. Uh, and also in the organic acid um, uh, panel, very important, I would pay attention to arabinose because ar arabinose and um, uh, oxalates markers, because arabinose indicates that you have colonization, active colonization of candida at this point. It often candida uh, seems to go really out of whack and start overgrowing when there's mold exposure. And so uh, my case uh, as well, so I, I wasn't surprised. And also when you see oxalate, it doesn't mean that you put people on oxalate, low oxalate diet. Oxalates are a side effect of candida going out of whack because you have mold. And so you have some markers there for mold as well. So when you have those two, and then if you run a full, a full protocol for EBV and people are not responding the way they should, then you are really looking for mold. And let me tell you, I've had a lot of students and patients resistant telling me they don't have mold. But when we pushed and when we talked and I asked questions, they would find that mold and the rest is history. So, so that's in combination with those labs, that's, that's what I recommend. Oh, and the second uh, question was about how often do you uh, take EBV, uh, uh, do labs for EBV for patients? I don't, <laughs> because think about it. If those two, the red and the green, remember, they're always going to be elevated. They will fluctuate. You know, they, if they're more than 600 or more than 750, that's you do want to retest periodically every few months, depending on where you are with the protocol. If you have some kind of uh, uh, markers that you want to hit, let's say you've done You've done uh, mold remediation. The person lives in a new home. And maybe after three months of that, you want to retest EBV or somebody has had a terrible stressful event. And you can, you can uh, do the testing right there and then to see if early antigen is reactivating, if they actually have reactivation right now as we speak. Otherwise, you know, those two will be elevated. Early antigen, you can hit or miss. Um, and VCA IgM, it's typically negative. What's the proof is in the pudding? How is the functionality of your patient? Is, is the Hashimoto's reversed already? Is the you know, chronic fatigue gone? Like, like you heard the story, is the person functional, feeling better than 40 years ago? That's, that's your proof. You don't have to test and retest this at a certain point. Uh, it's, not, it's not worth it. Um, and tests are not 100% accurate sometimes. Yeah, no. and this is something Kasha tried to teach us, but I still do the tests <laughs> about every five months or so in my patients. Nice. But I will say, if their insurance doesn't pay for it, they're expensive. Leslie, my nurse practitioner over there, was just telling me today each one of those antibodies is a hundred bucks if their insurance doesn't pay. So you're talking four hundred bucks every time. So. It is good to go more by your questionnaire and how they're feeling and how they're responding. And you've got a lot to work on on these patients. So you don't want to check it too frequently either because some of them do have amalgams they need to get taken out. Yeah. They do have you know, cavitations they need to get cleaned up. They do have heavy metals. They do have mold. They do have poor nutrition. I would say keeping them on the diet is the hardest thing of the whole thing. And some of them get better anyway, even, they're, even though their diet's still crappy. But um, yeah, it's quite a process. It's like, <laughs> even though I made up really beautiful handouts and lots of information based on Kasha's seminar, you know, these people are, they're kind of similar to mold patients. They get that anxiety thing going and they're like, oh my God, I can't do this. Do you have a coaching system for this? And we just put them through our system at the office, which is if you have questions, call. 
And then we're going to recheck, you know, whatever labs we're going to do, or we're going to see you again just to see how you're doing in two, three months or whatever. You, they're, they're just the kind of patients you have to, you have to keep tabs on them, right, Kasha? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So we, uh, in our program, we have two group calls and two one-on-one -on -one calls these days because I want to know them. And we are adding, we've always had a spiritual component because I believe we are spiritual being, having a physical experience. And so that reconnection with the hurts, with the traumas, the, the, this, it's embedded in that chronic EBV person oftentimes. But these things have to be healed. And we also, we also really pursue the joy, the heart opening, reconnecting with these areas, the dreaming, building, rebuilding life. Uh, because you know, you can you can break a leg, you can break a, a physically, but you're not gonna break a person. When you break a person, when the spirit is broken, that's harder. And some of these people are close to breaking point that way. And so, so it's not just physical. Physical is, you know, that's one layer. Um, by so the time Kasha, you, have, yeah. you have a support system, right? Where people can, don't they pay to be part of your group and, so they can do that and go to the meetings and whatnot. So, yeah, you know, if you feel like this is too overwhelming for your practice, I don't do it that way. But if you guys want them to connect with Kasha's groups, she can kind of, you know, guide them along, but you're still doing chelation, um, you know, yes. treatments yes, of whatever yes, kind. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that so. would be fantastic because then you, you know, you can delegate what I do every day. That's basically my focus, my students, our community. I'm always there. We're always moving forward. We have a lot of celebrations. We have a lot of inspiration and empowerment. We, you know, we do it together. So it's, uh, so yeah, that's, that's exactly what I do these days. But yeah, what you brought up about the emotional piece reminds me of what you were saying, Elisa. I think you covered a case where there was some emotional, a six-year-old motor vehicle accident trauma. <laughs> so yeah, with the people like you too, I don't do energy work. I have an acupuncturist that does some of that, but finding those people in your communities too. I guess that's another thing, Elisa, is there a way to connect with people in our individual communities that do energy work? Are there groups or um how, how do we do that yeah um i actually have a um i call it the cooperative healing network and i basically anyone who wants to join under whatever their main specialty is so i have you know acupuncture um rapid eye tibetan bowl um you know ev really everything that people can do and so basically they come and I vet them and make sure that they're who they say they are. And then they're a part of the network so that when people go to my website, they can actually look and find people. Um, the awesome thing about energy work is you don't have to be in the same location, right? So we can do it like from across the country. Um, so a lot of Zoom um, or just getting on the phone with a lot of um, my patients is what I do. And so that's a really beautiful um, part of being able to do that work. And tell us again where we would buy the actual, the OA machine. And I forget what you said. Yeah, I, I, there's a link um, for the AO scanner on the, in the paperwork at the very end. Okay. Um, and then for the um, iTeraCare, because it's so new in the U.S., they just got their customer service set up in September for us everything um so i don't have a link specifically on where to go but i am happy if you come to me i, I will get you to the right people to make sure that you can get your product so okay yeah all right that's a good question actually i wanted to share something because of my status i have to either rely on other practitioners to order lab tests or i have this website bltsystem.com that just recently changed the name, but it still leads over to the new page where people can order lab tests themselves. They can order what? Lab tests themselves for really good money. So the EBV complete panel is $88.42. And that is the Epstein-Barr virus, um, the IgG capsid antigen. It's the IgM capsid antigen, the IgG early antigen, and the antigen antibodies IgG, and they even have the virus, which is 
more, the PCR that's 200 something. But if you want to stick with that, you know, it's under $100. And there's one other EBV marker. It's go to BLT, bacon, lettuce, tomato, system.com. And they have this big five page blood panel that I use for routine labs for $250 or less, 236. I know we shouldn't really necessarily come out with these informations, but this is so good. The problem now is because of him having to obey to legal issues, you as a practitioner cannot use this to order the lab tests for your patients. The patient has to do it themselves, but you know, it's better than copay insurance and all that sometimes. I just thought of something talking about labs. Um, Doug was talking about earlier the Cleveland Heart Lab. Um, at our office, we use Boston Heart, and they are literally one fifth the price. So a lot of my patients that have five and ten thousand dollar copays that they never make, um, basically, you know, they can come in and get a hormone panel, male or female, for about one hundred and forty dollars, <laughs> and it's normally like six or seven hundred if they do it through LabCorp request and it's not covered. So Boston Heart is my go-to and they do have most of the tests that you were talking about, Doug, you know, the LPPLA2, the MPO, oxidized LDL, et cetera, et cetera. So any other questions? Okay, it is five o'clock. I thought we were ending at 5.30, but five o'clock's fine with me too. Eric? Yeah, it says on the thing 5.30, but hey, if we wanna get out early, it's fine. Oh, membership meeting at five. Okay. All right. So I guess we're done. Thank you, panelists. You guys are amazing. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Kasha. Love you. <laughs> bye. Love you too. Thank you, guys. Talk to you later. You. Yes, bye.